Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the October 17th, 2024 meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Thompson? Commissioner Thompson. <laughs> Sorry. Here. Dan? Here. Kennedy? Here. Paul Hamas? Gordon? Here. McKelvey? Here. Chair Conway? Here. So it's worth noting uh, what a different moment we're having tonight than we were 35 years ago tonight. And I want to take a moment to remember um, all that was lost in the earthquake. And I've been thinking about the thousands of acts of kindness that were extended that helped, put our, com helped our community to heal. And because this is a, a planning meeting, um, I want to thank the many people for the thousands of hours of meetings that it took to develop a planning process that put our town back together. And I want to take special note uh, to thank Commissioner Thompson, who continues his efforts to make our town beautiful. And finally, um, every year on this day, I say thanks to my brother, John. Statements of disqualification. Seeing none, we'll move on to approval of minutes of September 19th, 2024. Um, oral first. Um, oh, I was going to do that next. But um, yes, we'll do oral communications first. Sorry, I looked, jumped around a little bit. <laughs> um, so now is the point in the agenda where the public is invited to address the commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda, but that are within our purview. Uh, would any member of the public care to address the commission? Seeing none, now we'll go for approval of minutes. I move to approve the minutes of September 19th. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. Okay, we will move on to presentations. Um, starting with a public works presentation, lessons from a transportation system study uh, tour of the Netherlands. Good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Matt Starkey. I'm the transportation manager in the public works department. Um, here to talk tonight about um, a recent study tour um, many people from the city and around the county took to the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands is uh, a really special place for transportation. Um, in particular to me, it's part of why I got into traffic engineering. When I was in college, we did a study abroad trip to the Netherlands and it really um, <clears throat> kind of blew my mind actually as a person who grew up in Santa Cruz uh, cycling to school here uh, and always thinking about why that was so much harder than you wanted it to be. Um, and then you go to the Netherlands and you're like, oh wow, they have thought about things much uh, more differently than we have in the United States. <laughs> so it was really exciting to, uh, for me to get to go back um, with a group of professionals from around the county. So I'll share a little bit about our trip, um, some important history from the Netherlands that they made sure to bring up, uh, some neat ideas, uh, what the success stories are there, and maybe what's next for, for us here in Santa Cruz um, based on lessons learned. So the trip, we had 30 delegates from all the local uh, jurisdictions here in the county. Um, we went on a whirlwind three-day study tour of uh, The Hague, Rotterdam, uh, in Delft. And we did it all by bike and by uh, public transit, which was um, really inspiring. The Dutch are now known for their bikes, but they had cars. Uh, just like we do now. Um, after World War II, they heavily invested in automobile transportation, just like the United States uh, did and many countries around the world. But they had a sort of awakening in the 1970s. Um, there were two big events that happened. Um, one, there were a lot of uh, children being hit in the streets by cars. Culturally, they'd been used to being able to play in the streets before um, many cars started driving on them. So there was stop the kinder mood, uh, child murder was the big 
um, rallying call there. And then also the, the oil crisis of the 1970s um, started to get people to shift their mind. I, I highlighted here what sort of the fatality rates were in the Netherlands in the 1970s that sparked action for them uh, compared to what they are for the United States as of 2022. We do have a population difference, but it is quite striking um, the level of uh, vehicular fatalities that we allow to happen um, in our country. They talked a lot about transportation um, values from a lens of what was important to their community. And I thought that was really different from how we often talk about transportation and how I fall into that trap sometimes, where we talk very specifically about the mode that we want you to use. We want people to drive less, ride their bike more. Um, but here, that's not actually what they're talking about. They're talking about mobility as a value. And if you make your city friendly for kids, um, easy for caregivers, you make it accessible to a large group of people, uh, you make it um, usable by people who are aging, um, you create, a, by those values, you create a transportation network that can be widely used by a lot of people and is very um, appealing to them. So here's an example um, that they shared with us about school zones. And they do a lot, um, a lot different <laughs> things than we do with, with their roadway um, types here. Um, on the, the left is showing sort of a guide that they have around school zones. And within 100 meters of schools, they're often prohibiting cars. Um, so that's at the front door to the school. And then they have really different roadway types near them. Um, here's you know Walnut in front of Santa Cruz High uh, versus one of the streets in front of their schools. And you can tell the difference just by looking at these pictures, I think, how you might behave as somebody driving by the school or as a parent dropping off your kid at the school. Um, the picture in the Netherlands is very, you know, obvious that you should be slow. There's clear space for the kids. There's a clear pick up and drop off zone. And it's much different from different roadways. So you know to be more attentive to um, the, the small people that are gonna be um, coming, to, coming and going from that school. They also did a lot of different work with their roadway types. And I think we kind of have, in the US, a perspective on roads that they should all be very uniform. And that uniformity is what gives people the ability to see the sign and know to stop. But in the Netherlands, they take a slightly different approach where they invite a little bit more um, I'll just say chaos for lack of a better word, but it's, it's less um, um, particular than what we do in our design standards. And they are giving people cues to pay attention more on your own. And they sort of flip the responsibility from the traffic engineer putting the right sign in the right spot to tell uh, someone driving or biking what to do. And they instead are creating a space that self-reinforces the correct behavior here. So you can see the picture of the, you know, this main street. People are walking their bikes through the area. People are obviously, you know, walking through here. The cafes have spilled out into the street. But you would still see like a car doing delivery in a case like this. So it's still usable by everybody, but you know that you have to go slow here. Um, and then on the right is an example of a local residential street. And these are townhomes uh, in this development. But it's a small, um, you know, one-lane road, has parking on it, has um, a chicane in it, so you have to go slowly when you're driving through here. And you can see that people's front patios spill right out onto the roadway. And so it really connects people with the road and their street and enforces that you have to go slowly. So in this case, people, if you're walking, if you're biking, if you're driving, you can all um, be in that space together safely. I love how the trash bins are there, just like every street, you know. Oh, yeah. But they kind of fit in. <laughs> they do. I, I, I almost brought a special picture of some cool trash bins, but I, I didn't, and I, I should have. Um, <laughs> uh, here's an example of um, their other sort of roadway uh, hierarchy type, uh, a flow roadway. And this is where you have a road that you really are actually going to prioritize um, vehicular travel on 
Um, but when you do that, you're going to separate everyone out very clearly. So you can see in this picture uh, on the left, there is uh, actually a designated bus lane going into a roundabout, which was crazy. But then there's also the cars clearly have their space. There's nice separation. And then there's the red bikeway. And they've really gone all in on the color red for, for bikes. That's kind of their national standard for showing that bikes have priority in this space. And it's quite effective when you look at the, the roadway. You know exactly where um, people are supposed to be. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I did, did, this looks like a lot of right of way um, that they've, you know, converted to this. So they must have started out with pretty wide roads. Did they convert their existing roads? Is that how they ended up with all this tidy? There's, there's certainly a, a mix. This area of Delft was more of a, um, I think a more modern development space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, they had quite a large right of way here where they actually, there's a tram line actually in the middle of this photo too. Um, but then there are these, the smaller streets, um, you know, in the more developed parts of the city center. And in those cases, they are often choosing to share space between um, people. So limit vehicular traffic and share the space between people biking and walking. Um, so yeah, this case, plenty of right away, but they certainly dealt with the same issues that we do when we're sort of, we're challenged with how much park, do we have to take parking away on the roadway? Do we have to reduce a lane to fit these things in? That's, mm -hmm. that challenge is um, not unique to us. Thanks. They also stressed um, some key points about uh, the network. And I kind of put bike in parentheses here because I think it you know, applies to any sort of nice network of things that you might try to develop. Um, so the bike network needing to be cohesive, um, needing to be direct, needing to feel safe. Those are like the three main items to be a, have a successful network. We do all right on some of those, but I don't know if we fully hit the mark on those three here. And then the sort of the second, the last two there, being comfortable and attractive is what really starts to encourage people to, to use it. So the top three are really the basics you need to meet. And then the, the last two are the sort of next level. And I showed a picture here of their downtown train station as a sort of example of the cohesiveness of their transportation network. You have the train station, um, which is the big building there. You can see off in the corner, all the buses come line up right at the train station. And then down below um, is a walkway and bikeway into like the bike parking um, or pedestrian access into the train station. So it's just, it's so integrated in these spots um, for all your networks to come together. Because um, you could catch a train from Delft here to go to like Amsterdam or one of the more major cities. Here's an example of, um, I believe this was Amsterdam's bike network that they were showing us and, and giving the difference between the bike network and the, the auto network. And they really stressed to us the importance of having a, a good plan for your automobile traffic in the city. Um, that's something that I think we try to often do a little bit of everything on every road as opposed to really prioritizing uh, specific roads for certain activities. Um, so I think that that was a lesson we all took took home with us is you should have good automobile networks so people know where they can drive, but then notice how much denser the high quality bike network is. So in your city center, you're really encouraging people to use a different mode of transportation. And then for comparison, definitely not in the right scale, uh, I showed sort of our active transportation network map. You can see kind of how disjointed it is. And I think that's certainly a piece for us to, to improve on. What city is that? This, I believe, is, is Amsterdam. Yeah, that's what I network. thought. It looks yeah. like Amsterdam. <clears throat> so here's some of the results that they shared with us that really um, stood out to me. This is a, a graph of trips taken in the country and what percent they are by bike or e-bike. And look at how many kids are riding their bikes, 6 to 18, 50 nearly 50%. I mean, I'm not, not a parent yet that has to bring my kid to school, but can you imagine if you got 50% of your kids' trips to be done by bike, how much more free time you might have as a parent? That would be pretty amazing. Um, and then there's, on the other end of the spectrum, is older people are still riding their bike often at a rate higher than people, you know, like the 18 to 60-year-olds. To and that's really interesting to me. 
one thing we we often hear when we bring you know improvements where there's a trade-off between you know parking or bike facilities is people say well i'm i'm older i can't ride a bike and i think that this is showing us that maybe that is more about i don't feel safe riding the bike in the conditions we have today because i think we're seeing here when there is a successful bike network people still do choose to ride a bike when they're older and the netherlands was telling us about how you know, this is sort of their gener the generation that grew up right after the 1970s that still wants to ride their bike as they're aging. And it is a sort of emerging challenge for them is how to um, give people new skills as they're older riding their bikes. So it's sort of a, an interesting emerging challenge for them as a, a country that's really adopted um, bikes. And this, this uh, graph here is, um, sort of maybe a little more wonky, but this is trip distances and how, um, how, pe how many people use bikes for trips of that distance. Um, so you can see that these short, short trips here are, are more often used by bike. And I, I think it's important to remember that as when we talk about giving people options to, to ride a bike or to walk, it's not that we don't think they're gonna drive. The Dutch drive um, they have plenty, they have a lot of parking uh, in their downtowns as well, but it's, they're driving when it's a far distance. But the short trips around town, they've really made it so that people are going to want to ride their bike, bike for those. And so I sort of, you know, shared a little bit of information here, you know, like, uh, two thirds of our trips in Santa Cruz County are under five miles. You can see all the, the bars here. That's, you know, up to 45% of those trips by, by bikes. Um, how different would that be around town for us if there were that many fewer cars and people in some other form of transportation? I think that's, that's what's really striking to me about this is the short trips being done by bikes. And you can see where we compare. The city of Santa Cruz is pretty good. We have about a 6% bike mode share. The county is like 25 overall, and the U.S. is about 1%. So we're doing pretty good in the city, you know, relatively. But that's amazing, like in terms of transportation carbon if you just like extrapolate that out yes like we could hit our goals like in a week yes if everyone did that Seven, okay. 70 percent of our yeah, carbon yeah. emissions in santa cruz are from transportation that's incredible yeah. you have to keep in mind too that it's flat mm -hmm. yes and they have great <laughs> networks agreed good yeah, networks yeah, yeah. and santa um it's pretty flat but yes my one interesting thing kind of about the the flat not flat was the uh the e-bike stuff and i think we're <laughs> We've adopted e-bikes a lot more than they have. It's kind of a new thing. And it was interesting to see how, you know, e-bikes are sort of helping them go further distances. And I wonder if it would help us also kind of deal with hills. Get up get, to the west side. Right, get up to UCSC, for, <laughs> for example. But, yeah, it's a, it is a flat country, moderate weather. So it is, um, they do have a lot going for them um, already. So I think kind of around that, this is kind of where I think, planning transportation sort of really come together is talking about what this means for space um, that we have in our city and these two graphics just i always come back to particularly the people per 10 foot lane graphic here on the left we want to move a lot of people around um, doing it with um, bikes or walking or transit is the most efficient use of our space uh, and shown similarly here on the other graphic, just how much space is required to, to do these various things, to be a car driving 30 miles per hour or to be a car that's parked. You know, we've, we know that and, and state law now is really telling us to reduce car parking um, to provide more space for housing. So these sort, of, these sort of relationships between transportation and space that we have um, in our city to, to use to be a vibrant place um, is really important trade-off and I think you know the, the phrase they they said a few times in the in the Netherlands was uh let's see if I get it right uh God made the world but uh the Dutch made the Netherlands I think I might be butchering that but they it's a country that's basically built itself out of you know swamps and now they have all this land in a very vibrant um country so they, they really care but every inch of space they're using in their city has been thought of, which I thought was down to the drainage structures there. Um, so I think kind of 
with all those lessons, the, the next things we have coming for us are um, our active transportation plan update is just kicking off, so the timing of that is great. Um, the rail trail is under construction, um, segment seven, uh, hopefully opening around the end of the year or by early next year. And then segments eight and nine out to Live Oak are um, in design. Um, on the Bay Corridor, we have a multimodal improvement project. Um, we'll have a, a public meeting on January 22nd, I believe, at um, Bayview Elementary about that project. Uh, the downtown expansion plan is underway, and um, this is a cross-section from, I believe, Front Street, um, or maybe Laurel, but we're showing sidewalk level separated bike lanes um, in, that, in that planning area. And then objective standards, um, we are working on adding separated bike lanes into that objective standards, um, similar to how we do sidewalk requirements. Um, it's a little tricky for trying to figure that one out. Uh, and then transportation and land use, you know, must continue to be connected. Um, so this is a picture of our whole group out there um, by the North Sea. Wow. And um, yeah, th thanks for your time. I'm happy to, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for that report. It was very inspiring. Um, does any commissioners have comments? I just have one. Uh, Commissioner Dan? Thank you for the presentation. Um, I actually was in Amsterdam and then Copenhagen and then in Lago de Garda this summer, which are all like cycling meccas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm actually not a big cyclist. But I think what I gleaned from all th of those places was um, an attention to safety. Um, and so, and I think that that's really what we need to do to help people cycle more is because it's, it's just a, that feeling of, you know, I'm not safe doing this here. So, but thank you. I'm glad the trip was successful. I totally agree. And our, our active transportation plan is going to have a real focus on safety as sort of one of our driving factors to um, ensure that that's the sort of network we're building for people, something that's safe. Yeah. encourage them to use it because I agree it's that's a critical missing piece we have right now and the public transportation system there is is just epic um, right. <laughs> I'll admit I was in Amsterdam to see Taylor Swift and um, I but it was just so easy to get yeah. to the concert which was you know 45 minutes away but train I took the train and door to door I was home in 40 minutes it was mm -hmm. crazy just because of the efficiency of it all it was incredible yeah from a stadium that held 70,000 people it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think that's a mark of pride, actually, the Taylor Swift part. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your comments. I, that, that's great. Anybody else have comments you'd like to make? I've, okay. Commissioner Kennedy. So I think, like, at some level, like, density makes all these things happen over long standing civilizations. <coughs> and Santa Cruz is not that dense. So I think carbon drives us to do these improvements, like, first in a way, like before the <coughs> density is there in, let's say, Capitola or Watsonville or downtown. And so what do you think about that? I mean, I think it's something we kind of have to do for transportation, but is that out of order? What do you think about that? No, I, I think they're incredibly related. Um, <clears throat> dense, when we have denser places, the trip distances get shorter. And that's when we start to see that cycling or walking or taking transit become more uh, appealing. And so it's really this, I really see it as a relationship between those two, those two items that are going to make each other successful. Like if we want to, that's why I showed the, the graphic of how many people you can move per hour in a 10 foot lane. If we want to, if we are building a more dense downtown and we still want a lot of people to be able to come down here, they can't all get here in a car all at the same time. That's not going to be easy. But if there's a bus lane down Front Street, now all of a sudden we can get a lot of people downtown very quickly. And so I think those are those are the related elements between the density that yeah does make this sort of network um, more feasible, and it's what what makes it all more successful. I think at the end. Thank you. Great. Okay, Commissioner Gordon. Um, I'd be curious to know what the process is with this department from a 30,000 foot level in regards to the planning department and some of these projects that are being developed and coming to us. Um, I know there's a micro look at from your perspective on each individual project, but as a community, how do we 
um, integrate the potential developable properties that we're seeing come in front of the Planning Commission and how does that work with, I guess, the process of um, identifying where we get dense and where, you know, obviously it's very easy to talk about downtown and downtown expansion, but we're kind of seeing that in all different parts of the city. And so how does that play a role in how you plan this? Yeah, that's um, an interesting question. And we've, we've actually been meeting with some of our public works commissioners about a similar question. I think how I see it working um, is public works and plane are very involved together in sort of the, the initial stages of these planning documents. So the downtown expansion plan is an example of that where we've had, I don't know how, a ton of meetings about what the roadway cross section should be and what that sort of does to the, the developable parcels there. And so I think it's, it's early on a lot of coordination between our groups and making sure that those priorities align. And then the second piece I think is really the objective standards work where when we have the developments, that's when we get a chance to really advocate for what we think are important on our roadways next to them. And the sidewalks are a good model of that, where we are getting wider, better sidewalk networks um, with these developments that come in, you know, one at a time down SoCal or down Ocean. And so I think adding the, the bikeways into that is um, another tool for us to, to get there. Um, and what we've seen is that, you know, the we really only have so many arterial roadways. They all seem to be kind of getting this sort of uh, intensification on them. So that's why we've prioritized doing these separated bike lane networks on those roads, because they're high volume roads. You're, you don't want to share traffic on them. You want your own space. And so that's where if we get that into the development <laughs> standards, um, that'll help us make sure they get built in time. And then hopefully there's, over time, there's a bunch of pieces of these that come in, and then there's maybe a follow-up public works project that could then tie everything together um, as the development happens. And do you feel like you're keeping pace with the level of projects that are coming in front of us? <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. It's very challenging. I think that's where getting these, getting a good plan started in the beginning is what's helpful. But um, I do feel like we're, we're a little bit behind and we've We've caught up on Front Street with our um, our plans there with the transit lane that we're working on, but it's taking a lot of effort to kind of to, to catch up. And so I do think there's more work for us to do to, to make sure we're having these good plans that keep us a little bit ahead of the, the development. Thank you. Good, well, thank you. That was a, a really exciting report. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that we will move on to item number three, which is a public hearing. Uh, municipal Code Amendments to Title 18, Buildings and Construction Chapter 18.04 of the Building Code, creating an energy reach code for major renovations and additions to existing single-family homes, noting on CEQA, these amendments are consistent with the negative de declaration approved for the City of Santa Cruz 2030 Climate Action Plan adopted by the City Council September 13th, 2022. Could we have a staff report, please? Absolutely. Good evening, uh, Commissioners. I'm Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Resiliency Officer for the City. just want to make one more comment on Matt's presentation. You know, the Climate Action Plan has super ambitious goal for mode share for bike, 23%. And we're at six right now, so we really do need to adopt some of these principles in order to reach that. And that is just our state-aligned goal. That's not our goal of carbon neutrality. So just wanted to provide that additional context. But I'm here today to share with you um, a collaborative policy uh, between planning and the city manager's office for existing buildings, and that's the energy efficient renovations policy. We're here to get feedback from you all. You all have given us such great feedback on every reach code we brought before you, um, and we wanted to do so before we took this to city council. So I'm gonna be uh, introducing our team here today, because again, this has been highly collaborative. I'm gonna talk about the proposed policy requirements, and there are some uh, exemptions. Uh, give some examples of how uh, projects would comply uh, with this potential ordinance and our next steps, and then, of course, have some Q&A. 
Um, I do want to introduce the folks that have worked on this. We have a uh, senior planner, Clara Stanger, uh, chief building official, John Gervasoni. We have our consultant from TRC, Taylor Taylor, and of course, Matt Van Wa has been working with us as well. So again, today we really would like to uh, get some feedback from you all um, on this policy. Okay, just wanted to give you kind of the lay of the land. This might be uh, for some of the newer commissioners new um, and for the older commissioners or the commissioners that have been here a repeat. But um, we have uh, undertaken this building decarbonization effort dating back to even before our climate action plan was adopted. Um, as you all know, in 2020, we adopted a ban on gas and new construction. Fast forward to 2023, um, it was found that that was not um, in alignment with uh, federal uh, energy efficiency standards, and so that ordinance was suspended. But um, we also, after that was adopted, that initial policy was adopted in 2020, we began working on existing buildings and had some community conversations in the spring of 2022 where we looked at things like building performance standards, um, requirements at the time of sale of a home, time of permit, and we vetted that through different, um, those ideas through different um, stakeholder groups, and those were those community conversations in 2022. And then to get things moving, we partnered with Watsonville and Central Coast Energy Services to get a grant to decarbonize existing low-income homes here in Santa Cruz and in Watsonville, and that project is uh, underway. As I said, in 2022, our Climate Action Plan was adopted, which re-emphasized the need um, to do building decarbonization, both in new and existing buildings. We uh, suspended the gas ordinance in summer 2023, so we peeled off existing buildings, and we brought in fall uh, a new construction energy reach code, which this commission saw before it went to council. Um, it was approved then uh, in the, uh, the winter and went into effect this spring. Um, then we got right back on uh, in the winter. We got right back on uh, developing the energy efficient renovations policy. And I just wanted to mention what decarbonization includes because it's not just electrification. It's energy efficiency. It's renewables. Um, and so forth. So just wanted to put a plug for that, that decarbonization does not always mean electrification. So one of the big context pieces that you need to know about, uh, about this policy is that we're really uh, building on what the state is doing. So the California Air Resources Board has introduced zero emission appliance standards with phased implementation starting in 2027. Um, these standards aim to reduce emissions, improve air door, indoor air quality by targeting uh, residential and commercial appliances, including heaters and water heaters. Um, and by 2030, all new space and water heaters sold in California are expected to mean zero emission, meet zero emission standards, very similar to what just happened with gas leaf blowers at the start of this year. You can no longer buy one in California. Um, this initiative is, of course, part of the state's broader uh, strategy to meet carbon neutrality by 2045. And just to, again, provide context, 26% of our community-wide emissions are from building energy. So our climate action plan does have um, this state-aligned target of a 40% emissions reduction by 2030 from 1990, and recognizing that that really isn't aligned with what science says uh, needs to happen for California and for, uh, for the United States to meet um, the, uh, or to keep the tipping point for um, greenhouse gas emissions um, from being exceeded. And so our leadership and our community really press for an aspirational target of carbon neutral by 2035, 10 years before the state target. That is a voluntary target that we have here at the city. Also contained in the Climate Action Plan are a number of measures and actions that really specify uh, electrification and decarbonization, specifically Measure BE2, which calls for electrifying 31% of existing residential buildings by 2030 and 53% by 2035. Um, this is also supported by, I think I'm missing something here. Oh no, I have my energy efficiency and local solar programs also, two different measures, um, equitable energy efficiency and local solar programs and electrification. So again, a couple different components of decarbonization. 
And what does this mean for us? So BE2, which pertains to existing buildings, we uh, in total, we need to reduce 76,000 metric tons to meet that state aligned target, our legal target. Of that, the opportunity around building uh, existing buildings is 13,000 uh, metric tons. So about 17% of our total reductions needed are bundled up in existing buildings. And we've estimated about that this policy um, will reduce emissions or avoid emissions really um, 850 metric, metric tons of CO2 per year. So a pretty substantial amount. Also just wanted to point out that the city's trying to walk the talk itself. Um, we do have a decarbonization uh, measure for our municipally owned buildings. And as such, uh, we've just recently replaced um, our water heaters with heat pump water heaters. We've upgraded almost all of our lighting. Um, we have two buildings, the Annex Building um, and PD, that have been electrified with heat pump HVAC, uh, funded by California Energy Commission grant. And we are uh, waiting for some funding to uh, complete a municipal decarbonization roadmap to really give us a strategy for going forward rather than doing so in ad hoc and opportunistic kind of way. And I think we're going to fund that internally. Um, the grant that we applied to actually got canceled because of the state budget, unfortunately. So let's start getting into, OK, how does this thing work? Um, so first of all, I think it's important to um, remind ourselves about how do our buildings use energy, because that is the basis for which this um, policy is built on. Um, so we use energy uh, for heating, as you can see, kind of left to right, heating and cooling, um, for uh, water heating, uh, for appliances. We have solar um, that feeds into the grid. This kind of thing that looks like a film is build the building envelope. The tighter that we can make our building envelope, um, the less uh, energy is going to escape our house and the less that we have to use to keep it warm or cool. Of course, lighting, and then over here is our hot water heater, and we've got a, an electric vehicle here. So lots of places where we use energy in our homes. And when are energy decisions made? Well, they're made when they're built and designed, right? They're, mil they're uh, made when something breaks and you have to replace it or fix it. And lastly, they're made when a building is undergoing a major addition or alteration. So what are these things? So a major addition um, could look like um, a, a we are defining, I should say, a major addition to be the addition of 350 square feet. Um, or an alternate alteration would be an alteration that uh, addresses 350 square feet of property of the of the home. So here's an um, example. So our situation is that we have a, a homeowner of a single family house that applies for a permit. They're adding a 350 square foot um, addition, uh, so a second story with two new bedrooms and a full bathroom. And the project valuation is reported at 230,000. One thing to remember is project valuation is not construction cost. So I just want to remind folks of that. It's a formula. Um, so you know, I, know, I realize that it's going to cost more to build this than 230,000, most likely. But things to think about with a major addition is that the homeowner is already going through the permitting process and complying with local uh, codes and requirements. They are already working with a design team and a contractor team. And that's really, all of this together makes this really the right time to make additional home improvements. Importantly, it's unlikely that the project or a home is going to do another major remodel for another 20 or 30 years. So it's important that we get it at the next um, addition or alteration. Also, the team's already assembled. They're engaged. They have the knowledge to support the decision making. As you will see, there are a number of cost effective options, which is a requirement to put a law like this in place. And of course, there's efficiencies in scale with doing multiple projects at the same time. So in sum, these large renovations really are one of the best opportunities to make improvements, not only for the emissions reduction, but to improve the comfort and the satisfaction um, for residents with the control that they have over their spaces. So what's a major alteration? 
So this is, uh, again, any construction or renovation to an existing structure other than a repair or addition. And as I said, um, a major alteration is altering 350 square feet of the existing floor area. And same as an addition, requires permits, requires a team, an architect, engineer, energy code compliance expertise, and a contractor team. And so we have an example here. And we're going to come back to these examples and how can these examples comply. Um, a single family home altering 350 square feet such as converting two bedrooms in a hallway to three bedrooms and adding a new bathroom, and the project valuation is reported at 135000 So let's put a pin in that and come back to that then after we look at um, the proposed energy efficiency requirements. And I will say that um, a number of jurisdictions have taken this path. Um, Piedmont, Marin County, Carlsbad, Encinitas, San Luis Obispo, and several others. This, there are essentially two directions that are happening for existing building uh, decarbonization, and this is becoming the mo most dominant path. The other is um, on air quality, which the Bay Area has started to go all in on, but has kind of backed off on seeing that this is becoming the most popular uh, ordinance for existing building decarbonization. So to set this up, um, our, of our building stock, most of it's single family homes. 96% of our buildings are residential, and of those, 87% are single-family homes. Another very important piece is that 84% of our single-family homes were built before 1991. So they have dated systems. They have dated wiring. It, that's an important consideration. Again, if we don't capture these now and upgrade them, they're not going to be ready for the carb appliance standards. And we're going to have to wait another 20 or 30 years to upgrade them, these systems. So our proposed policy at a glance, again, is for a major addition or alteration, which we've previously defined, a project applicant would need to select from a menu of energy efficient um, measures and in some cases have mandatory requirements to provide outlets for future zero emission appliances. And we're going to show you what, what this measure, these menu of measures looks like. So I want to emphasize this does not say you have to electrify. It really is about efficiency. And we really want to be clear of what this doesn't apply to. It does not apply to small projects, appliance replacements, windows or roof only projects, cosmetic changes, or work that doesn't require a permit. It doesn't apply to kitchen appliances or gas stoves. So it's, I think that's important to remember. An analysis of the past permit uh, data uh, enabled us to project that about 300 permits per year would be affected by this ordinance and that they have a median project valuation of 130000 And again, that's valuation, not like Correct. construction cost in the field. Okay. Co Correct, yes. So here's what we're talking about here. So the requirements... Uh, should this be adopted, is that the uh, applicant would need to install any number of measures from the table on the right-hand side that add up to a total score of nine or greater. And there are literally dozens of combinations possible. There are at least five cost-effective combinations, and you have the cost-effectiveness study that was part of the agenda report as an attachment um, that demonstrates that. And you have to complete all the mandatory requirements. And you can see those in the lower right-hand corner, uh, which entails panel-related pre-wiring. And if you touch a mechanical room, a kitchen, or a utility room, or a laundry room, we would like to require the electric-ready pre-wiring so that you're ready for when that new CARB appliance standards goes into effect. Can I just ask a yes, question? Absolutely. Okay. I'm sorry, because this is an important part, and I just want to make sure I sure. understand it completely. So say you're remodeling your kitchen, and your kitchen is very big, and so it's 351 square feet. And so, but then you still, then you would be in a situation where you have to do some of these other things that add up to nine points, even if it has nothing to do with your kitchen. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. But if you look at some of these measures, duct sealing, insulation, there's some really low-cost measures that together could be aggregated that doesn't necessarily 
mean that you have to go get a new heat pump water yeah. heater. Duct sealing is pretty easy, but we'll say if you already had that done, then you can't redo that. Well, you can't. You can take credit for it, though. I'm getting there. Okay. Yep. You're, you're thinking one step ahead or one slide ahead here. So as you can see here, there are a number of different measures. Yes, there are appliances. If you buy the electric appliances, those are going to get you points, but it's not required. All of this is at the choice of the applicant. Um, and all the way down to solar PV um, and uh, electric ready pre-wire for, for uh, batteries. So what could this look like? In addition to the mandatory measures, you could reach nine points. As you saw previously, you could exceed nine points with a heat pump water heater, number one here, or a heat pump space heater, or you could install solar PV and electric ready pre-wire. You could also install, install floor installation, or as is shown in number five, you could do a combination of these lower cost type things. Um, and there are many more combinations. These are just, you know, just a few ways that um, compliance can be met. So about the electric readiness, I wanted to be really clear about what that means. So if a project involves a new electrical panel or an electrical service upgrade to 200 amps, electric readiness components will need to be installed for space heating and water heating appliances. Also, if an alteration or addition includes work, I mentioned this before, in the utility room, a kitchen, laundry spaces, electric readiness components will also be installed for electric um, appliances, meaning electric water heater, heating, uh, heating or furnace, stove, clothes dryer, depending on what the room is. And if you're installing solar PV to achieve a compliance, you must also include electric readiness for water heating, space heating, and either Sto uh, battery storage or EV charging. And that last one is actually specified in the energy code already. So this is not a new requirement. Some other things that we want to emphasize is that we're not just looking to drive emissions reductions here. As I mentioned at the outset, these types of um, improvements will increase the comfort of the home, less drafty homes, um, will provide a more consistent interior uh, temperature, reduce exterior noise because you're going to have a, a tighter building envelope and actually decrease pests. Um, in some cases, they'll reduce even health issues, right, like asthma that's exacerbated by, um, by gas, by the, by the combustion of gas. Um, you'll have greater control on heating and cooling capability. <clears throat> we already know the benefits of solar, energy security, little maintenance, and then the readiness measures really, again, are getting us ready for the California Air Resources Board um, requirements that are coming the, on appliances, and it will reduce future work needed by completing at one time, right? You don't have to come back and pull everything apart again to meet these new standards that CARB is bringing forward. So some additional benefits. What, what do you mean by that? What, by which? By when are you suggesting that when CARB puts out standards that folks will have to rip out their appliances to put new ones in? Well, if, if they, not that they're going to have to rip out. They do it by attrition. Right. Not that they have to rip out appliances, but if, if they are in the market for a new appliance, they would have to rip, sure, rip absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I just think it's important to be clear. Just absolutely. so it doesn't, we don't get rumors out there that the state's going to come down here and tell us we have no. to rip out. No, our you appliances. can't. You won't be we able should to be accurate. Yeah, it. absolutely. Thank you for rumors. Yeah. When your awesome wolf range reaches the end of its natural life, yeah. there might be a 110 outlet pre-wired back there. Exactly. Kind of, kind of thing. So I that understand. it's ready. Yeah, thank I you. No, I appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah. Um, okay, so just continuing on, um, there are proposed exemptions, and I've already touched on some of these. We have an exemption for repairs. There is a pre-compliance exemption to your point, uh, Commissioner Dan. Um, so let's say that you've already installed solar. You can take credit for that if you've already st in installed uh, the 110 outlet. You've done it. You don't have to do it again. So there is, if these things have already been done, you get to take credit for them. So you don't obviously don't have to come back and get a score of nine and not include 
the measures that you've already done. So that's a big thing. Also, historic buildings, um, the applicant can res request an exemption for any of the requirements that would it, um, impair the historic integrity of the home or uh, of the building um, that's listed on the Register of Historic Structures. Also, for hazard mitigation, really the only example of that is seismic retrofit. That would be exempt. Temporary structures and manufactured homes are exempt. Um, manufactured homes that comply with Title 25. Um, and cost burden. Um, we do have an exemption for if costs associated with the compliance exceeds 20% of the project valuation, um, the chief building official can reduce the total number of points that need to be achieved to keep that uh, cost at or under 20%. Also, I've mentioned uh, if you're only touching the roof or windows or roof and windows, um, by nature, those are more energy efficient um, and uh, those are exempt. And then lastly, and you may have seen uh, in your correspondence, and this is something that we um, are working on uh, refining the language around, is that um, ADUs to which a statewide exemption applies would also not be subject to this ordinance. Um, the ordinance that you have now, we have just begun, we just um, worked with our attorney bef uh, after we submitted the documents for planning commission, so the ordinance does not include that exemption, but it will for uh, city council, so we're working on that still. This is the letter we received today? Yes, there was a letter uh, correspond in the public correspondence that um, spoke about this, and we were already aware of this uh, cool. before the letter, and we're working on the language for the exemption. Sounded like a good point to me, the letter, even though it was delivered at the last minute. Yeah, we can't uh, preempt the statewide exemptions. Okay, what are the cost impacts then of this policy? Um, so uh, we uh, expect that the median project valuation for permits that are captured by this policy to be about 130000 the estimated typical cost of compliance, and this is excluding incentives and rebates, and you will see there are extensive rebates and incentives available, is it about 6,600 or about 5% of that 130,000 project valuation. So let's go back to our examples that we, that we looked at previously. So here's the major addition example. Again, um, has a second story, two new bedrooms and a full bath. So in order to comply, this project chooses a heat pump hot water heater, which is about 6,500, and LED light bulbs, $250. Um, the total cost compliance uh, is about 3% uh, of the, uh, the project valuation, so it would increase the cost by about 3%. The measures are cost effective, and <clears throat> there are rebates and incentives available up to about $5,000, and higher for low to moderate income. So really a net cost of less than $2,000 for compliance in this particular scenario. For a major alteration, and again, this was one that we were defining as converting two bedrooms and a hallway into three bedrooms and renovating the kitchen with a project valuation of 135,000. In this case, the project chose a heat pump water heater, electric circuit and outlet for electric cooktop, and installs in uh, LED lighting, $7,500 total compliance costs, so increases by 5.5% uh, the project valuation. The measures are cost effective, and again, the rebates and incentives are about 5000 for this particular uh, combination, leaving a net cost of about 2500 to meet compliance um, with this uh, example. So I want to just emphasize what this policy won't do won't regulate the use of gas cooking equipment or other kitchen equipment or appliances. It does not require electrification. It's not triggered by small projects, window projects, projects that don't require a permit or single appliance replacements. And the flexibility of this policy does help us to consider special on-site challenges or circumstances, such as pre-compliance or historic buildings. So what's out there in terms of resources? Central Coast Community Energy, who did uh, write in our public correspondence in support of this, provides direct incentives um, 
starting at 4,600 on up for these types of um, uh, appliances and, and um, equipment. There also is a limited self-generation incentive program that has some applicability. Um, also, I'm very excited that the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments is standing up a regional energy network which is funded by the public utilities. Um, we've seen in other uh, RENs across the state, additional incentives, training, education. So it'll be incredibly supportive to our building decarbonization efforts. Also, the Inflation Reduction Act has uh, about a 30% tax credit for each improvement, although there are caps per measure and a cap on totals in a given year. I mean, do they ever, I just did my taxes. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a done. lot of money. It is, and what's you know, I remember when I did my solar, I didn't have the full tax liability to take it in one year, and it rolls over, and which is over yeah, which is really nice. Um, also, we're exploring <laughs> services to help community members navigate complicated projects. For example, I myself went through a program called Quick Carbon, where I took pictures of all my gas appliances, mm -hmm. uploaded one uh, utility bill, and they gave me a customized plan. And they kind of put me on a timeline and they've been bugging me about it. When are you going to do this? How about this? This is a great time for this. And help you navigate those incentives. Um, and then lastly, uh, on Monday, we're resubmitting a grant proposal for low-income decarbonization and resilience in frontline neighborhoods. So that includes tenant protections and affordability, but also will help to defray costs of these kinds of things and other resiliency measures. That's a HUD Pro Housing grant that our uh, Pro Housing designation enabled for us to be able to apply to. So lots of incentives available. I think one of the challenges is navigating the incentives. So we've done a lot of community engagement. Um, in August, we had a city council study session where we really broke this down in detail, got some feedback. Just met recently with the Santa Cruz County Realtors Association. Um, we had a virtual webinar with developers, designers, and contractors, with the public also. We do have a decarbonization web, web page. We have a, a frequently asked questions that we continue to add to, and we have a survey out right now. <laughs> Excuse me, we have since our study session to take feedback and we're looking at that periodically and, and addressing it. And we've gotten some really great feedback from the community that we've integrated into, um, into this policy. So what's left? Um, we will continue our community engagement. <laughs> Excuse me. Our community engagement through November. Um, we have planning commission today. We are planning to bring a first reading of this ordinance to council on November 19th, with a second would be on December 10th. And should that uh, should the ordinance get adopted, we'll file with the California Energy Commission and the California Building Standards uh, Commission. That we're anticipating will take about four months to get approval from, particularly from CEC, and we're uh, like for the code to take effect by April 1st of next year. That is my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions and feedback and really eager to hear from you. Great. Well, thank you for the presentation. You're it was, welcome. It was really great. And um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask if commissioners have any questions, um, and we'll take questions before we um, open it up to the public, but we'll hold our deliberations until afterwards, please. And I had one question, and it is about this presentation. I thought it was really understandable. And is it available on that website? It will be right after tonight. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, commissioners, questions? Yeah, Commissioner McKelvey. Good evening. Thank you very much for, I, I've read through all this and it's an immense amount of work and I really appreciate you doing it and staying with it for so long, but I do have some questions. Um, how are we determining that 350 square feet is a large project? So we wanted to align this with the green building program and 350 square feet, I believe, is the, uh, the threshold for the green building program. Right. The, I guess the reason I'm asking is that there are immense costs associated with this rebates or no and the idea that it's being triggered Commissioner in, McKelvey, yeah. could you please hold your uh, yeah, arguments course. about it right now as for questions? Okay. And please ask all of your questions. Um, can you address um, 
Okay, I need to regroup then. Okay, sorry, oh, I didn't you can come back to, to me. I appreciate it. That's all right. Definitely well, looking forward to your thoughts, uh, but now is for questions. Uh, Commissioner Gordon, my question is first to you: How broad do we want to get with this um, in terms of the questions? Because I mean, I have questions, but they're uh, this big is this, these questions right now are really about clarification about what's clarification. being proposed. Okay, and um, but we will also be digging deeper into. Yeah, so, I mean, um, right. we're, we're not looking to move into deliberations, but if you need more information to form your thoughts, please ask them now. And I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Me? Yeah. Oh, for him. Yeah. Oh, me. Okay. Well, um, and maybe you can, we can save it. I'll ask the question. I do have questions about the, um, the, valuation um, process and the uh, specifics around that so that somebody could really understand what that calculation is. And similarly, um, the hardship component and the, um, I guess, potential subjectiveness of that and how that was um, discussed or deliberated. So. I think those would be great questions if you could answer um, what that process is, both valuation process, I think a lot of people wonder about that, and also um, how the hardship is determined. That'd be great. Absolutely. So the valuation process, and I'll ask John Gervasoni to give you the specifics, but it is an, actually a formula that's utilized um, to determine. And John, I don't know if you can share with us the components of that formula. Sorry. Um, so I think what needs to be understood is, and, and I noticed through the presentation, there's a difference between construction cost and valuation. So when it's saying it's, it's a certain percentage of the valuation, imagine if the construction cost is higher, that percentage is going to go way lower. Um, mm -hmm. But to get into the valuation, the valuation is based on a formula that the building department uses as to the occupancy type, the construction type, and the square footage involved. Typically for residential construction, um, and, and this is to base permit fees on, and that's, that's it. So for um, new construction, it's based on $220 a square foot. I'll guarantee you there's nowhere in this town you're going to build a new addition for $220 a square foot. So... Um, Remodels or alterations are half of that, $110 a square foot. That's how we base our valuation for permit fees. And I will say this is a question that we had in, we have in our frequently asked questions. Um, we anticipated that that is something that folks, it's not obvious clearly because it's different than what our construction costs are. Right. Great, thank you. Hey, and then is, there's another question, but I wanted no, to follow, follow up on this. Go ahead. Is that okay? Yes. I had like the mm -hmm. same thought. So on that valued project that was one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, if I remember right, the threshold would be you'd hit hardship at twenty percent of that, mm -hmm. so which would be I just did the math probably wrong, but that'd be twenty six thousand mm -hmm. bucks. So if if the contract like brought your receipts and said, hey, you know this is going to cost me twenty seven thousand dollars. Am I getting that right? Because it, my brain is twisted because it's like a valuation on the denominator mm -hmm. and a real hard cost on the top, right? Right. But am I getting that? And does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if it if it exceeded that twenty six thousand, which gets to your question about the hardship, right? Because that would be over twenty percent. Then the building official would be able to sit down with the applicant and give them, okay, where can we reduce the score? so that it gets you under the 26,000, where you can perhaps eliminate one of your choices of your measures. So, I mean, it, well, it seems like it wouldn't come up terribly often at that rate. That'd be really hard. You'd be really in a bad hardship to get to that construction cost. D did that answer your question? Okay. And uh, Commissioner McAlvey, did you have a further question? Sure, just a couple. Um, you noted that the ADUs that are considered state exempt 
are being considered for exemption. Um, I'm wondering why all ADUs are not. And then there are a ton of very technically definitive requirements for circuitry, physical space, ventilation, circulation of air. Um, and we're, we're, we're putting these demands on people when they are, uh, I guess my question is, why are we why are we doing this now when the 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 technology may have changed significantly by the time people actually end up doing these improvements? So your your question is that we may have more efficient technology Absolutely. in time. Mm -hmm. And is that and and isn't it a question for the people that are designing the building? And to comply with the rules that are already in place, a lot of them, and that are coming down the pipe. Um, there are some very, you know, specific technical directives mm -hmm. in here um, that may or may not apply by the time someone actually does that work. But they will have spent, a lot of money will have been spent in the meantime. I think that we would have to run through a specific case because, with, like, with electric readiness, mm -hmm. I mean, Voltage requirements likely won't change. Right. But some of the requirements will involve PG&E getting on their future planning, uh, you know, in in their, um, and this may be a discussion point. I, I don't want to yeah, overstep. I, well, I want to make sure you get your question answered. It's really about. And um, I think it was answered. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and in terms of picking it up as a further discussion point, we, we certainly will do that after we hear from the public. Do you have any other? It, there oh, was a, his first question on ADUs. Oh, yeah. Right. Sorry, that go ahead. The AD, why aren't all ADUs exempted? I'm going to ask Clara to come up to speak to that because she's been working with the attorney on the ADU question. Um, and it's, it's a little bit complicated. Clara Stanger, senior planner. So um, there is a state law um, that was just recently enacted, SB 1211, that's coming into effect January 1st. And that um, substantially limits the kinds of standards that the city can apply to statewide exemption ADUs. Statewide exemption ADUs are defined in the state code as a very, um, well, there's a few different types, but they're very specifically defined. And the new state law says that the city cannot apply any kind of objective standard beyond that specific definition of statewide exemption ADU. So we know that what we're coming up with now are, are some local standards that we cannot apply to statewide exemption ADUs. Um, the letter that we received from the California Housing Defense Fund had um, some comments about all ADUs, and we are looking at that closely with our um, city attorney um, to determine um, to what extent we would or wouldn't need to also exempt those from the code. So we're looking at that, and we'll have something figured out by the time this goes to city council. Great. Thank you very much. And that was it for your questions? Okay, Thank Commissioner you. Kennedy. In my day job, I'm finding like 110 volt coming really fast in water, heating, air conditioning, like you name it. So, uh, and this kind of ties in with John's question, but it's the reverse of be getting smaller. Where is that considered in, in, in your work here? And uh, the, what, what do you think about like 2030, where we'll be with 110? You know what, I'm gonna ask Taylor to to speak to that. I don't know the answer to that question. Hello, everyone. I am Taylor Taylor with TRC, which is an environmental consulting firm, and I've been working with city staff here on this policy. It is a great question. We are getting it all the time, specifically in regards to the water heater, since the 110 volt technology is becoming more familiar. For this policy specifically, what we're pretty much doing is having those electric readiness requirements reference the 2020 energy code. Um, which is going to specify the 240 volt outlet. Um, the thought there is just that it's more consistent if we're referencing the state code um, and that this is really about like a small subset of projects. It's not necessarily applying to all, um, but I, I do understand the concern um, and other jurisdictions are considering how to address that as well. So the thought is if you install the 240 volt outlet, that is definitely going to be enough. Um, it's gonna provide you a water heater that's big enough to supply the whole home. <laughs> 
it's going to work all the time. And if you want to modify that down to a different kind of voltage outlet, that would be a potential at the time too. Um, so yeah, for from the effect of simplicity, that's why we're referencing the 2022 energy code requirements so for new construction. Would you be open to reconsidering that? We could consider. Yeah. It does seem. It does seems like. You we'll, know, we'll take that up like afterwards. That. Okay. Did, did you have other questions? Nope, that was it. I w want to be careful with that line. Okay, I'm great. ready for some good discussion. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dan? Um, yeah, I just had a couple questions. Um, one was, um, is there anything in the proposed code that we are being required by the state to adopt? Anything in this REACH code that we're... Yes. Is it all discretionary? Are we required to adopt any portion of it? No, it's, it's all, an, all, it's all in addition to. Okay, got it. Um, and then the other question was um, just trying to understand um, the thinking behind, um, you know, cause of, of having 350 square feet and the same threshold, no matter what the valuation is for all projects. If, you know, for instance, we have homes in Santa Cruz that are, you know, 1,000 square foot old beach cottages, and then we have homes that are 2,500 square feet on the Upper West Side. And it seems like having uh, the same threshold for projects both on valuation and square footage might unfairly, you know, um, might be not equitable um, for folks. And so I'm wondering what the thinking was behind that, of maybe, you know, if the valuation for a project was much higher, you know, maybe nine points is, is good. But if it's a lower valuation project, it's the same, same number of points you have to reach no matter what type of project you're. So I was just wanting to understand the thinking behind that, having everything be the same. I think, though, if you think about those two different cases that you gave, thank you for the question. It's, I haven't thought about it before this. But if you think about those two different projects, you're going to have different size requirements for those pieces of equipment for your bigger home, right? So the cost may not be comparable, right? It depends on how many people are in your home. If you have a bigger home, theoretically, if you're housing more people, you're going to need a bigger water heater. You might need a bigger uh, HVAC or whatnot. So the costs are different, even though you still have the same point requirement. It's not an apples-to-apples -apples piece of equipment. Right? It's a bigger piece of equipment, more likely for a bigger home. Right. So I'm just trying to get at, and I don't, maybe this goes into discussion, but to lead that into, you know, leading into where I'm going is that um, I think it's worth considering having different requirements mm -hmm. for bigger projects as to not unfairly burden mm -hmm. a smaller home, which might be, you know, theoretically, let's just get pragmatic here. That's going to be someone who's got less money, usually. Commissioner Dan, you I am going to ask you to hold those okay. thoughts. It's a really good question. I hear you. I just wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, just get to see there. where I'm going. Yep. Sure. Get you thinking you. about it. And I, I think that's uh, really going to be great deliberation. Commissioner Thompson, do you have any questions? I have a, a, a useful question. Okay. And, um, I, 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 oh, you need uh, your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm, um, I am fascinated by... Um, by how complicated things are and mm -hmm. how um, uh, much change there will be over time. Okay. And uh, so my experience with this, uh, as limited as it is, is that um, it's quite specialized information. Okay. And um, so the, the, uh, the, the uh, homeowner is going to be completely lost, but even the mm -hmm. people that you would think you would sure. turn to for information are going to struggle with this. And so this notion that there are, um, there's the expectation that the city is going to have to provide a lot of counsel okay. um, as that, part of the process. Point, too. So hold that thought. We'll hear from the public. And I'm sure that this will um, help shape our discussion um, as well. I do have one more specific question. Can I oh, just of ask course. it? OK. And it actually relates to um, Matthew's comment. Has there been an evaluation of the cost to the city to administer this level of um, all the things that are going to be required in order to monitor this and staffing? Yeah, we haven't 
estimated a cost per se, but we certainly have thought about the workload um, and what it will entail. Um, and, you know, John can speak to this a little bit more fully, but, um, you know, we still need to do the plan review. That doesn't change. We still have to do the inspections. That doesn't change. So it's an education process for our team on these new requirements, just like we had for the new construction that came through. Um, to the point about, um, you know, folks are going to need to consult with the planning uh, counter, and they can do so. That's one of the questions that we actually have in our frequently asked question sheet is they can come into the building counter at any time to get that kind of help. So um, we do realize that. But I don't know if John has any other thoughts about the capacity, but, you know, that's what we've discussed thus far is that, yes, there's going to need to be a training, but mm -hmm. these are processes that we're doing anyway with buildings. Okay. Um, so, no, I, I believe that the plan review time is not going, it's going to be minimal, the, the amount that it's going to add. Yes, you're going to have to look at more things. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with the building inspection time. It's, but I, I think the time increase is going to be minimal. Okay, great. Thanks for that. A good question. Okay, um, and with that, I will open the uh, public hearing. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address the commission. Um, you'd, you'll have three minutes. If you would please sign your name, just so it, Tess can uh, make note and um, welcome. Thank I'll you sign for coming. My name on the way out. Um, that's not mine. That is the letter that was referenced, and the author asked me from Housing Defense Fund. He asked me to give you guys. Um, You've already gotten it. Okay. I didn't. You know, since it was the same day. Okay. Great. Um, so, uh, again, those are not my comments, but and I appreciate all the work staff did and the forward thinking. Um, it's a great presentation. I appreciate the flexibility um, and the exemptions. However, some of the comments or the questions that some of the commissioners already made uh, speak to my issues. Um, the 20% hardship burden, that's crazy. I mean, 20% to an evaluation $230,000 project. That's $46,000 extra that someone would have to pay. And, you know, if, if the average project is 5%, why don't you bump that threshold down to 5%? Building costs are already really expensive. Housing is so expensive that the city doesn't need to burden builders and homeowners and renters further. And that's what this is going to do. And I thought that the questions you guys asked about, you know, different technologies coming up is also speaks to one of the issues with this. Another thing that no one has mentioned, 2023, I, have, I live in an 840 square foot house. Uh, it was built in 1950. I had a 70 amp panel with no uh, main disconnect, only branch circuits. I, in 2022, I applied to upgrade my panel to 200 amps. I drive an EV. I have since, um, since 2019. I have a solar thermal system. In a, on a different house, I have a photovoltaic system. I'm all in for decarbonization, but we have to do it in a smart way. And I don't think this is a smart way to do it. <laughs> it took me 11 months just for PG&E. They said I needed a new transformer. 11 months. And it wasn't like they told me it would be 11 months. They didn't tell me how long it would be. So that's another factor. I think you guys should delay this completely, in, number one, until PG&E gets their stuff together mm -hmm. it, it's it's just not really feasible for someone doing a you know it, it just doesn't work as to the uh, rebates i'm sorry that uh commissioner paul hamas isn't here you should ask him about the rebate uh, and the incentive he didn't get for doing his heat pump they're not so easy to get and um so i know some work i just i just got uh you know i got some ev rebates but some of the building ones aren't so easy. So, um, and the issue with the ADUs, the reason the ADUs are are exempt is because it costs more to do this stuff. They don't want to put extra obstacles in the way of building. And you guys should think about that because, you know, if you make it too onerous, it's going to make people not want to do the upgrades. And we do have an older building stock. So you put another $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 onto a project, that's, that, that makes a difference to people. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. I think 
Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I really hope that you will listen and take to heart what the gentleman just said. And to that end, I wonder if any of the stakeholders were from the building trades, the unions. Um, they, they are going to be your guide here about what is reasonable. And I completely agree that this is not um, a good idea to put additional costs as burdens to building the housing that this area needs. I, I have a question about uh, if the cost to put in, uh, one of the options was to put in a battery storage. Because of the fire danger of those um, facilities, there would have to be extra fireproofing to the structure, and that needs to be factored into the cost. Um, the state fire marshal recently changed, is in the process of changing code regard, regarding battery storage in buildings. <laughs> I, I also really question the wisdom at this time when electricity is not, uh, we don't have enough. <laughs> you know, um, I hear Google getting ready to put in many nuclear plants so that they can know that they've got enough what about the grid? Can it, uh, do we have it? Can we uh, so realistically supply these structures for these, um, these improvements? Um, that's my main part. And I, I'm, I heard staff say, um, that was a very good question about the burden on staff to monitor and, and administer this. Um, and I think I heard staff say, well, it would kind of have to be like a training in, in progress. You don't want that. <laughs> um, and, and if I didn't hear that correctly, I apologize. But you don't want to put the bill applicants through a process where people are being trained and each person could give a different interpretation of what needs to happen. That's um, happening too much already in different jurisdictions and uh, is making people not want to get permits or to follow through with them. In closing, I'm very happy to see that uh, there is an exemption for historic structures. If you can just define what that is, I've heard different um, definitions of what a historic structure would be, but I'm, I'm happy to see that there's some uh, a nod to those. ADUs, does, does it include junior ADUs? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Would anybody else like to address the commission? If so, please come forward at this time. You'll have three minutes. Good evening, Planning Commission members and fellow residents. My name is Kyle Jordan. I'm a renter at 138 Jewel Street here in Santa Cruz. I'm educated in environmental management, and I'm a planner employed at CSU Monterey Bay. I'm here to express my concerns about the proposed renovation reach code. I believe the triggering threshold is too low and should be raised. I appreciate the desire to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is very necessary to meet our statewide goals. I rode my bike here. My wife and I own, own only one car, so we're doing our part to try to reduce our impacts. I'm concerned about the fact that increasing housing costs will continue to make it harder to live here. I've been a renter in various California cities since 2008, and I'm hoping to buy a house here in the next five years. But as it stands, the median new home cost, uh, median home cost is 1.3 million, and that would have an $8,000 monthly mortgage and property tax payment uh, associated with it. The existing housing stock is definitely outdated and of low quality in many cases. As a renter, I'm well aware of some of the existing deficiencies. Any home that I may purchase will probably need renovations. Additionally, I'm not going to be able to afford to purchase without some sort of ADU, JADU, or secondary renter. With the city's proposed reach code, it'll be harder to afford uh, the necessary upgrades to build a secondary unit or to renovate um, a unit. Uh, 
I wasn't aware of the exemptions uh, when I wrote this comment um, uh, for ADUs, uh, but I want to just bring up the point that I'm hoping that you can exempt ADUs and JADUs from uh, this REACH code. Um, these units are critical for providing more affordable housing options, and the code uh, will discourage their development, limiting affordable housing. These uh, uh, new units will already need to comply with Title 24 energy requirements and should be excluded from this policy. I urge the Planning Commission to reconsider the 350 square foot threshold, raise it to a 50% threshold so similar to other California REACH codes, exempt ADUs and JADUs. Please help uh, reduce the costs of housing in this community. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. Um, with, re with regard to sustainability and resiliency, I think both are important. And as an engineering professional, uh, I factor whole life costs and life cycle costs in all my projects. Um, in some ways, this parallels the Native American seventh generation principle that states that every decision, even governmental ones, must consider how it's going to affect seven uh, generations. When when I see that there's requirements for potential energy storage or uh, photovoltaics and some of the other uh, items, I'm also concerned if the this forward-thinking city has considered recycling efforts for those. EVs eventually fail, they will go into the garbage. How does that handle? So I would like the city to also consider the effects of some of these measures, uh, not just for our generation, but for way down the road, especially when it comes to recycling. Um, for, for automobiles, you know, lead acid batteries are recycled. We have oil recycling stations. I'm not sure about some of these uh, uh, sustainability and energy efficient decarbonized methods, how that is handled. So I'd like to see if that can be uh, brought up in the future. Um, <clears throat> one thing I, I saw in the documentation was that the grid is labeled stabled, but I know I've lost the power at my house a couple of times this year. I live in District 3. Um, and I believe if the Diablo nuclear power plant in San Luis Obispo wasn't bailed out, I think we would have had a much more unstable grid this summer and other peak power times. So, and even today, I did. I received an alert for the uh, power cutoff because of the weather situation. So if, as we electrify, factor in how resilient is our system. Um, now, in reading this, I found uh, the ordinance. I did find some inconsistencies that I would like to hand out, because I think there are some items. Um, the chief building official uh, should be made aware that one of the uh, items is a violation, <clears throat> excuse me, a violation of the current uh, NEC code. And that's documented in this paper, and I'll, I'll hand you something too. Um, now, on the topic of JADUs, ADUs, and your, your, your great work, uh, I noticed in bullet nine on the presentation, it was talking about exempt ADUs, statewide exempt ADUs. I want a question about the non exempt ADU and the JADU, because of, again, those items as they're attached at least the JADU is attached to the single family resident. Uh, what I'm concerned about is the uh, burden for making more housing. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'll ask, is there um, anybody else here who would like to um, address the commission? And seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for many thoughts and deliberations. Who would like to start? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Commissioner McKelvey, go. <laughs> I'm, go I'm, I'll just go through it in order here. Um, Good. Thank you so much for doing all this work. I, I am very supportive of the sustainability goals. I think they're ambitious, even at the state level, but obviously anything we can do to get there faster is a great goal. 
Um, I do worry about the threshold. That was my first question. Uh, someone mentioned 50% increase in the floor area. I don't know how equitable that is because it means that someone that already owns a large house can add more square footage and not be affected by the rules. Maybe it needs to be, but I would really like to see it raised. I think that 350 is, um, it's just not much. If you have a growing family or you have, you know, even if you are disabled and you need more room in your house to get around in a wheelchair, which, you know, unfortunately I think about these days, um, I think um, it would be much more logical to have the threshold be higher because these are big burdens that are being put on each one of these projects. So, you know, I don't know if it's 500 square feet. I don't know if it's 750 square feet. Um, I would be open to what other people might be interested in considering, but that that's in the 10, uh, 18, 050, 040, the, the major addition and the major alteration <laughs> question. Um, as I went through the, um, that, that applies again in number four under 150.0 W, which is added. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then it's funny how several of the comments that came from the public, um, the, the, I think the presentation spelled out that these are three to 5% bumps in cost of, of, um, of a project to, to execute some of these uh, requirements. So why couldn't it be 5% instead of 20? 20 is, could be very big. And, uh, on top of that, it's a discretionary call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, item number two under sec exception two to section 150.0 W, um, I would, I would propose that item I, do we need to do a motion to do this? We're, or are we just discussing? We're just having discussion right okay. now. We're, we're quite a ways from a motion. All right. Um, please, please make a note of all of your questions and proposals. I have it in green. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and we, it, now is a great time to let us know what they are. Yeah, that's, I'm going through them one at a time. I'm just skipping down to the things great. that I'm proposing as changes. Perfect. Um, so in item I there, I'm, I'm proposing, I think maybe 5% is more. It's, it's supported by the evidence and maybe not quite so onerous. Um, granting, granting of exemptions under item two in that same section. Um, I would like to make that more of a, I'd like to have some greater clarity about what would lead to whether it's granted or not. And um, I think if the, if the building official determines that it is a hardship or infeasible for the applicant to fully meet the requirements of the chapter and that granting the requested exemption will not cause the building to fail to comply um, with the California Energy Code, et cetera, the chief building official shall grant the exemption. That's, I, I think it can be much simpler than the language that's there. Um, with the denial of exemption, I, I would just add after requirements of this chapter, comma, I would put including the 5% exemption threshold if we were to agree to change that. I think that would be more reasonable. Um, in the next section, number four, the last sentence is an appeal. This is about the appeal of a determination. An appeal of a determination of the chief building official, official shall be filed in writing with the, and then I've added, with the Board of Building and Fire Appeals, instructions for such appeal shall be included in the notification of the denial. So that people know that they can appeal it and they know how. Um, exception three, I just added at the end, um, this is about uh, previously installed measures. Uh, it says, then these measures shall not be required to be newly installed, and I added an appropriate credit shall be included in the applicable compliance calculations. Um, <clears throat> I think the historic preservation question is maybe better directed to the planning director. Um, so I, I would propose replacing the chief building official with a planning director in that case. Um, I have some point score changes that I would propose under the water heating package. 
I would because some of some of these early items they only give them one point or two points, but they're some of the most expensive changes that are proposed. And I would say the first four items could be bumped to three points. And further, I would not make the utility room, kitchen, and laundry related electric ready pre wire or the panel related electric ready pre wire, even though it's, I think a comment was made that it may be coming down the pipe from the state anyway. Um, I would not make those mandatory and I would make them maybe a four point um, uh, element that, could, that you could use to comply. Um, under water heater package E1, I struck water heaters 20 gallons or less or water heaters that are not able to add exterior insulation may not take credit for this measure. Water heater blanket is not required on water heaters less than 20 gallons because it says that down below and in the exceptions. And then after dwelling units without individual water heating systems may not take credit, may take credit for this measure only if supplied by a system that meets the requirement of this chapter. So it's just, it's just treating each dwelling as the same. I do have one final question. Under section 160 point, it says section 160.4 <clears throat> of the California Energy Code is amended to remove subsection A as follows and then sections B to F are adopted without amendments. And then it says sections D and E are added as follows. <clears throat> are these newly proposed as part of this amendment, or this, this ordinance? Or are they in black so that it makes it seem as though it's part of the code already? That's, a, that's just a question. Just to be clear, so your question is on section 160.9. No, the, point 0.4. Oh, point, I'm sorry, yes, one point, point 0.9, yes. 160.9 that says sections A to C of mm -hmm. the California are, Energy, Code. Energy Code are mm -hmm. adopted without amendments. Right. And then from there. Sections D and E are added as follows. So right. A and C are already in the code. Yes. And D and E would be added. Okay. So... Um, this is where we get to the highly technical requirements yeah. that are placed on something that may or may not have any relevance when this work actually gets done. I'm not saying it won't. I'm just saying that we're talking about a timeline, even under the accelerated timeline that the city is pursuing as the aspirational goal. It's, you know, it's 10 years and the state, it's a little more than 10 years, and then the state is a little over 20. So that's just a question. Okay. Sorry for that. No, that's okay. And uh, was that the your comments for now? Okay, we'll be coming back to you, I'm sure. Commissioner Excellent. I, I just wanted to note, too, there there is talk of motions and things like that. Yeah. This was a, a courtesy item as an yes. info item. Yeah. Yes. So there wouldn't be a specific motion, but if the chair does wish to seek consensus on certain comments, we're, we're taking notes on everything. Good. But if there's certain thing you would, would like to pull consensus on, mm -hmm. feel free to. Okay. We do no, have, I think we thank can. you. That is actually really helpful because this is one of those items where um, what we've really been asked to do is talk about it. Um, and uh, to talk about it, we, we are. Commissioner Dan. But I, there is nothing to prevent us from putting our Absolutely recommendations nothing. into yep. a motion to make it easy. We certainly could if we wanted to do that, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Commissioner Gordon. I'm going to go 30,000 feet. <laughs> John, John was <laughs> real granular. Right. My, uh, I'm curious um, if there was discussion uh, in your departments about incentivizing versus creating um, policy. Um, I know other communities in the state have um, created incentives versus forcing people to do this. And so um, I'm curious if that was discussed. Um, and I'm bringing it up because there's um, 
well, for all the things that everybody said, the challenges, but also uh, in our architecture and firm, we see that most people are interested in doing this, but a lot of, there's a lot of challenges with creating um, a policy around it. Uh, so, and expenses and time and all those things. So. Yes, so um, we did discuss incentives, and because incentives are available in different forms. I should clarify, non-monetary incentives, because the one thing about grants and the monetary things is, even as you said, they go away, or they're not available anymore, or they run out. So some incentives that have happened in other jurisdictions have been um, building related like incentivizing somebody to so like um, waiving your permit fee or things like that yeah um i mean i can kind of get in i could get into specifics it's not really that i mean that extreme but there could be a prioritization and timeline of approval process there could be um there's you know in in the time that i you know <sighs> Free time that I had to research this, there's been um, rate uh, rate reduction discussions in communities. Um, so there's been a variety of different discussions and things that have been adopted. And so I'm just curious. So I, I want to be clear, not rebates financially. Sure. Thank you for clarifying that. I thought you were talking about monetary incentives. Um, right now, um, exemption of permit fees, not on the table for us. Um, streamlining is not really on the table for us right now um, so it these things were raised in the initial um, conception of this policy um, but I think in general without having a policy in place we will not reach our decarbonization goal and I don't think that incentives as positive as they are are going to get us there I think we need and with that said, and I should have mentioned this, is that this is likely the first of potentially more uh, ordinances that may come forward around existing buildings. We considered this to be a very moderate one, but with just this policy alone, we will not reach our goal targets. So I think that's not the only reason i think there are other reasons we can't discount our we need to recoup costs on our permit fees for example um but to me we we need a lot of options available to us in order to reach our targets which is what i'm tasked to do understood um is there i guess i'd like to know what the um the urgency that Santa Cruz feels that we need to increase the timeline by 10 years and also um, are we, I mean, I think Rachel asked this, like are, are we're, it sounded like we're not mandated to do this. We could wait for the state to, to put the policy on us. And in fact, we could go through this process and create a policy and then the state could go ahead and hand us something totally different is that that could be the case, yes. Um, however, the with respect to your question about why the urgency, our leadership directed us to adopt that policy. It was not a staff recommendation. And so that is what we're working under is to meet the very ambitious goals that have been set yeah, for us. Thanks. I, yeah, I, I realize now that, that I need the answer to that. I said, okay, got it. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you. No, whoever, who's ready? I was going to wait till the end. But. Okay, who's ready? Are you ready? Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Commissioner Dan. Um, thank you for the presentation and for all the work that went into this. It's a super, duper complex policy. It's very consequential both for staff and for uh, the community. Um, and generally, I, I, I just think it's, it's not quite ripe yet. And I understand that the council directed us to do a REACH policy, but I... Would be really, I'm in, really interested to see what they think about this um, policy direction um, because I agree with Commissioner Gordon um, for policy like this where we're trying to nudge the community to do something that's good for them, good for us, good for the planet, 
um, that it works best to incentivize and not penalize. And you know, I, I don't see this as it's not like a penal ordinance, but it's a requirement ordinance um, as opposed to um, an incentivizing or voluntary ordinance, which I, I think are um, doable and can be successful. Um, and so I, I'm just going to be encouraging that staff go back and look at creating an ordinance um, in that vein. Um, but if it does proceed, I have some suggestions too. Um, and then I'd also just add, you know, many of the requirements on here, they do save folks money. And so a lot, a lot of folks are just choosing to do this because um, it'll save them money. Heat pump will eventually, you'll get your money back eventually. Um, but it's a, it's a big upfront cost. Um, you know, this does, you know, like the last meeting we had, we were talking about um, um, changing policy for ADUs, and I had concerns about increasing um, the cost of home ownership. And so I have similar concerns with this ordinance. It's, there's no question that it'll uh, increase costs for homeowners. It'll increase costs for people wanting to buy a, buy a house in the one of the most unaffordable places um, in the country. Um, I think it's true rebates dry up and are variable. I, I, I ran into this myself recently where I thought I was going to get a $1,500 rebate for something and then the money was all, had all run out. Um, pg and &E delays are reality. I'm dealing with this with a friend of mine, um, same issue, I can't remember who, maybe it was Commissioner McKelvey, um, 11 months for pg and &E to come out and do something with the panel. It's ridiculous. Um, so should this proceed, I generally agree with the direction that Commissioner McKelvey laid out, um, that the trigger uh, should be maybe 50%, or I would even maybe suggest on a graduated scale based on the size of the square footage of the homes. And, um, to, and then in that, if we're going to go in that direction, smaller homes should have a higher trigger, so they're not penalized for trying to grow their family. A lot of folks can't afford to move, but they have a growing family, and so they just want to put on an addition, and, and um, we should think about not penalizing folks who want to do that. Um, I also agree the cost burden should be reduced to 5%. Um, I also think we should consider um, exempting small projects, maybe valuations under $100,000. Um, and uh, and then also consider a graduated progressive point requirement based on valuation, I think would make, uh, would be more equitable. So those are my comments. Um, I would support um, a recommendation with, based on general, you know, those thoughts and these. Um, if the commission goes in a different direction, I won't be able to support the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great, thank you for your comments. Uh, Commissioner Thompson. Um, I have um, a slightly different take on this because when I read through this, I, um, I'm not really practicing as an architect anymore, and it, I couldn't imagine when I would actually get my arms around uh, most of this. So I just thought about my own house, which is, um, uh, I built it um, and new, but it isn't new anymore, and uh, stuff is wearing out. And so I asked myself, uh, so um, what is a sensible way for me to uh, nurse this, um, this old house along and uh, get some improvements out of it? And um, it was, uh, the easy one was, okay, I've got a couple of old appliances I could replace, uh, uh, low-hanging fruit. Um, but I realized that, um, and I've already redone the insulation um, in the attic and underneath, so I've tried to keep up. I've got solar panels on the roof. Um, but the big deal is that um, my windows are worn out. Um, and uh, the only remedy really is to replace all my windows. And um, it would have a substantial impact. Um, I suspect that I could get really close to not heating my house at all if I replaced my windows. Um, and uh, so um, I'm not sure how those kinds of uh, calculations get mm -hmm. figured into our way of thinking about this. Because I live in a house that I can't add on to. It's right. in a planned neighborhood. Um, uh, I, um, I can't add on to it. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but the sensible things that I need to do to be um, clever about 
saving resources have to do with things that um, are really just replacing things that wear out, mm -hmm. or in some cases replacing things that um, uh, uh, there's just a, a better uh, replacement technology now. And um, I, I suspect that there are some of those things. Um, uh, so I, I, my, where I'm going with this is I just have some questions about uh, strategically how we approach this with an aging um, uh, uh, community of buildings um, and what we really want to do is use less energy. Mm -hmm. um, are there some strategic uh, 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 things that we can do that um, uh, get the most bang for our buck out of just um, in steadily improving our existing housing stock? Mm -hmm. um, because I think it actually makes a big difference. Um, uh, I, I just uh, uh, improve the weather stripping on the doors in a, a, a rental and uh, realized that uh, for, for a really small amount of money, I had probably had a, a, a pretty big impact on, uh, on the house and then realized, well, that sure isn't very romantic. I can't right. crow about that one. <laughs> <laughs> But um, uh, so I, I, I applaud um, the work that's gone into this, and it's uh, consistent with what the state is proposing that we do. Uh, I think uh, mm -hmm. this is a, um, an important part of what we should be doing. Uh, I'm just I'm not convinced that we have perhaps gotten um, our hands around the, uh, you know, the low-hanging fruit of mm -hmm. just stuff that wears out. Uh, and where there's uh, 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 basically a, a significant difference in what we replace it with. Sure. I appreciate your comments, and I, I also feel like it tracks pretty well with the policy as it evolved. Mm -hmm. Because in, in that, as I understand it, I mean, a window project isn't going to be subject to this at all, nor are, are appliance replacements. And those are really powerful changes that um, that people can make. So I, I think that was that that's a helpful discussion. Um, I don't know what to do with it. But that's, sure, well, no, those are my thoughts. It's, yeah, I mean, um, probably more public education about you know how how worth it it is to change out windows and appliances. <laughs> um, and if you were able to add on 350 square feet and you could afford it, yeah. those improvements you made, you would get credit for. <laughs> well. Right. Uh, so you'd be all set. I, I, I actually think uh, we probably underestimate the mm -hmm. amount of uh, housing buildings that we have in Santa Cruz that we actually can't add on to. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, right. There's been this kind of assumption that, um, uh, oh, we've still got room to add on. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not convinced that, that it's, that's an endless inventory. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to follow up on that. I'm really interested in hearing what Commissioner Kennedy has to say, but I've, I have um, also really wrestled with what the threshold is and um, about, you know, when we need it. And I've talked to um, some builders also, you know, how does it feel? But then when I think about um, your point um, and what's, what's already exempt, and then I also, it's useful to think about my own experience. I did an addition in order to create an accessible bedroom and bathroom. And um, it was less than 250 square feet. It was, um, it, or this is 350, but um, <coughs> it was about 250. And so it, wouldn't, it would have been exempt anyway. And um, I don't know that that's, I, I mean, I know there's an awful lot of projects that were analyzed, but I am interested in what is the threshold. And also very, I'm, I'm also very concerned about costs and um, making housing unaffordable. Um, and also, I understand why a REACH goal is important. And I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I'm pretty passionate about this one. I'm glad we don't have to vote, because there are three architects up here. And, mm -hmm. you know, we'd have to get four to pass something along. So <laughs> I appreciate you all putting up with the uh, daily code um, grind. So, like, this is my day job. This is what I do. Let me organize my thoughts. Um, generally, it seems very balanced. Like, I hear the concerns, and that's fine. 
A big theme I wanted to bring in that I think will help people get on board, hopefully, is just being consistent. So I had two, like, two thoughts about that. One, we could theoretically recommend like delaying implementation until January 1st, 2026, which is when all the ruthless new state codes are coming your way anyway. Like I, we can talk about that offline, but it's going to be hard. But then at least they'll all come in at the same time. So what would we lose? We'd lose eight months of permits. And like by my rough math, that's like 200 remodel projects. I'm totally fine with that. I think the slightly reduced chaos of the new code cycle with the building plan checkers and especially the design community and God help the clients we all have to you know explain this to you. I think that would be well worth it for those 200 houses. Also smart people if they really think they're gonna hit that 26,000 bucks or whatever they can ram their permit through I think. I don't know how busy you all are but they could shoot on through before that maybe theoretically. So that might be a good recommendation maybe we could all get behind. Um, I have another one, but let me like just get a few things off my chest. Options are not requirements. There's some muddling of what's required here and what's optional. So I want to be really clear about that. And based on our state's wild, too fast, extremely successful last 15 years of green building, this stuff works. You know, and I can say that. And it works because you provide tons of options for the people who want to do it or will do it. And then those two mandatory requirements, you gotta do that. So you get a tiny little stick there at the bottom for the person that really does wanna do it. That works, I mean, long story, but we're down 3% as a state in carbon emissions. I think this is two year old data that we're from. So like, it's working, let's keep doing it. Um, oh my gosh, that IRA tax credit, there's some details, but it's literally an IRS form and you like write in how much, we paid 32 grand for solar panels and roofing and it's like one line and then whack, they take it off the top of your taxes. So yes, rebates are bad, but that 30% IRA tax credit, that could go away with the next administration is very easy to claim. Um, so I was kind of just like, oh, that's true, but you know, give me a break. There's plenty of uh, incentives out there. The PG&E thing, God knows we all hate PG&E and um, <laughs> Like, I don't even live in the mountains, you know, I live in here in town. So I feel it. I really think, I'm not sure, but if you're doing a three, if you're doing your panel, you're doing your panel. I don't think this is gonna like make you do your panel in addition. That's just my thought, you know. I, but I, I see, I'm sure there's examples. My house had like one screw in 15 amp, you know, when I moved into it. So we just did the panel 20 years ago and it's done. But I want to uh, say that if we cannot have pg e delaying people renting housing, so I fully want to back that up. And uh, that's a very politically popular stance, too, being against pg e But it's a mess, and it's not going to get better, I don't think. If I may, mm -hmm. on that point, I believe there's a new law that does require pg e to reduce their times to reasonable to address panels and transformer upgrades and so forth. So I did want to make that point that the state is trying to address that right now. Also, the IRA tax credits are authorized to, it's either 2032 or 2034. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. So like now I want to, I have one more, we'll all agree on, but I want to go hard on climate and change in action. We all know we have to do this. We've been nudging everyone a little bit here. Our awesome, groundbreaking green building program is now completely voluntary. You know, so has it served its purpose? I think so. It was a great nudge. I think everyone here remembers the solar walkway light, right? If you're like one point short and you hit final and you happen to get my Kansman, you'd have a solar walkway light in your truck and it cost $19.99 or something at Home Depot because it was a long time ago. You'd whip that out and put it in and boom, you passed, you know? So that was great 10 years ago. It's not working now. We need the sticks. Let's go. This is a very light tap with the stick, but we have to do it. Um, my last idea that maybe everyone can get on board with is can we put in a self-destruct mechanism that says like in 2030, January 1st, this whole thing goes away. And here's where I'm coming from. 
is our code is cluttered with stuff that was a great idea 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like I know we're gonna have Tiffany or her successor, whoever, updating this several times before then. But on principle, it would be nice to have a self-destruct clause in there because. Are you talking about a sunset clause? Yeah, sunset clause. That's better. Self-destruct sounds more dramatic. Uh, last <laughs> example is the the toilet thing, right? We have those toilets. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. Oh, it was yeah. like the jackbooted troops are coming in to take right. your toilet. Right. Give me a break. It worked for five years. Wow, wow. Someone spent 300 bucks on a Toto toilet. Now it's gone, right? Because you can't buy an old super high flow toilet anywhere in the state. So that's all we're doing here is like chucking this little plug in for a couple of years here to fill the gap, to stay ahead. And, you know, by 2030, you'll be driving to Nevada or Oregon to get your, your gas water heater. So I say, people use that to say, why, why do it? I say, let's do it. You know, we'll get however many, 300 times that many more houses will be ready for the all-electric future. So that's my point. Okay. Um, any follow-up comments? I have. Um, I guess I'm still trying to navigate. <laughs> I mean, the state has basically said we can't put these regulations on ADUs because housing is a priority. And that's all that we're doing up here for months on end. And now we're being like, it just doesn't feel consistent. So it's like, I'm really having a hard time getting behind this at all, really. Like, I just feel like it's premature. I, I obviously am I'm <laughs> in support of all of the things and, you know, like, I understand it needs to be done, but I guess I'm just really having a hard time deciding that we're just going to um, put this in this one area, even though we're being told by the state, and I think everybody can agree that housing is the priority, not making things more expensive. So I just... That's where I sit with it. Okay. I totally hear that criticism, mm -hmm. and I really accept it. Yeah. And I think it's true, and I would just say that Climate change is an objective standard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty clear. Objectively, yeah. right? But the, sure but the clients that well, I deal with every day are making that choice. There, there isn't a client that I've had that's like, oh, well, I'm not going to do that because it's not required. It's it's not the case. I'm I'm dealing with the real people on the boots, and I don't know about John, but I've I've so to be told that I have to do something is like. This is, I mean, just looping it all together is like, it's going to take test staff time. I know Mr. Gervasoni says that it won't add that much, but <laughs> it's going to add something. And if somebody decides they want to go through the hardship thing or all of the subjective things that triggers people, there's going to be paperwork and time invested in it that we're going to be paying for as a community. Mm -hmm. So if... If we're, I, I understand we're solving for this very big thing, but the reality is, is that the people that are getting the permits right now are meeting the, the goals. That's what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, if so, that's that's okay. so we're we're there. Uh, uh, well, hang on, oh, one, uh, sure. uh, one second. So, f first of all, thanks for your point. Um, and Commissioner Kennedy, did you want want to make another point in response? Well, it's just more of a question, but when okay. we say like $130,000 valuation, I think that's based on square footage and not like if you have a big mm -hmm. house or a small house or where your house is, right? I was going to sure actually clarify that because like I, I was going to make a point. Yeah. It's actually 350 square feet of impacted area. Right. Yeah. It's not an addition. So right. it could be within the house. Yeah. yeah. It gets, could be, that's called the alteration. Yeah. So is it, it is. possible for you to like spitball right here on the spot? how much real cost that job is, or is the variation between those just too, too much? Yeah, and I actually am not sure that that's useful. Um, I, I, just in terms of fanning the flame about what the dollars are about construction costs and what the point is of having a valuation. I mean, the point of, the val of having a valuation is, as um, John explained, is so that they, we can set a fee. It's a comparison number. It's yeah, not, yeah. and, and it's, there's um, a matrix that sets it up. And it doesn't, it, of course it matters to the homeowner um, about what the actual dollars is. But I think messing with that isn't going to make anything 
clearer and it'll just kind of fan the flames. Did you have a point? Well, it's, yeah. Would you come to the microphone, please, okay, to get, get it recorded? Nope. <laughs> Sorry, because this, this whole thing, construction cost valuation, kind of gets out of whack. It does. Okay, so we were talking 230000 what you wanted to use as valuation, but it was more like the construction cost. So if you had a 230000 um, fee to do this 350 square foot addition, you divide that, that's about $657 a square foot. That's average construction here, in, okay. right? Mm -hmm. We're telling you our valuation for permit fees on new construction is $220 a square feet. Right. So, you know. And, and, and that, that's exactly my point. I think, I think yeah. it's relevancy for this discussion. I, I, I appreciate the way it was set up. I think that was the proper way to do it rather than actual dollars. Although, um, I'd like to chime in on what I think I've heard a fair amount of consensus on, which is what the hardship burden is. And I'm not, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I think um, I heard and I agree that um, if it's supposed to be in a th 3 to 5% range, then um, why is 20% the hardship? Maybe that, that's the one thing that I could really see as, as um, being reduced to, if it isn't five, maybe it's 7%, because um, I know there's a little wiggle room in there. So um, that, was, that was just my, my comment. And um, did, did other people have follow-up to that? Um, my, let me say one more. Okay, sentence. please, go ahead, Commissioner Kennedy. So this is like what I do in my day job? And mm -hmm. Like, I think it's fine and it's a good balance. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate, I know TRC has done work across the state mm -hmm. with all sorts of different communities and all sorts of stakes. And mm -hmm. I think it's great. It's a source of pride to me to be mm -hmm. in the lead here. Yeah. Understanding the pain it brings to your clients. So I say we still do it having weighed those things. Yeah. And, and um, as far as our job tonight, um, I, I do think our job tonight was to consider um, this change and to provide feedback. It isn't necessary um, for us to have consensus or make a motion to um, pass this along. And um, uh, also, I think I think we've we've hit um, consistently um, different areas of concern, um, which I know that staff will be communicating um, to council as they um, proceed on this. Um, did you have an additional comment? Well, yeah, I think it is useful for us to like summarize where our areas of consensus are. And then um, I do think, I mean, I, I share a lot of mm -hmm. the views that Commissioner Gordon and McKelvey um, articulated. So I think that it is helpful to, um, if, if this the purpose is to pass on our recommendations as varied as they are to the council, that, that it's identified um, that, you know, Commissioners McKelvey, Gordon, Dan, Felt, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just trying to figure out a nice um, uh -huh. um, um, <laughs> way. Not a, well, just a, a method in which makes staff easier to be able to articulate um, what we're all saying here to the council. So if you it, think well, I, you've I got it. I disagree, actually. I oh. feel like they, um, I, I feel like we're off the hook on crafting that and coming to agreement because they already are No, no, I'm that. not suggesting we come to agreement. Uh -huh. I'm just suggesting that, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand how, if, how, how our areas of consensus will be transmitted to the council. I'm just concerned that that, that, that be done um, because it's so, cause, just because it's, it's, you know, some of what we're suggesting is a, quite divergent from what the staff report said, so. And I can speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, as you saw in your agenda report, we did include mm -hmm. where there were concerns from the community and how we address them. And we would do the same thing with your comments. We would disclose those to city council. And in fact, your comments, of course, we're going to take back and synthesize and potentially make changes. You know, I, I don't know at this point, but. Build a green building program. And <laughs> so that, that, thank you for saying that. And I actually, like, if that is the template you're using, I would, I would, I just suggest that um, you, you provide a little bit more detail and specificity from, our, for our comments. Because I actually, when I read about the community meetings, I was like, God, I wish I knew more exactly what some of the folks said. It was actually pretty brief. So um, I think we, okay. we went into some great detail. 
Mm -hmm. John, um, Commissioner McKelvey went into great detail, and I actually think, and I would like to just, no, no, it wasn't too much. It was, it was actually really well thought out, mm -hmm. yeah. and I didn't repeat what Commissioner McKelvey said because I agreed with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't repeat what Commissioner Gordon said because I agreed with her. I had some slightly different suggestions, and that's what I articulated in my notes. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess I just wanted to make sure that that's clear because this is a really complex yes, piece of policy. It's far-reaching, it's reach policy, um, and it represents a big change. And, and um, I think the outreach was really, really well done, but clearly most of the community doesn't know about that this is happening. So um, I, I, I think it's, it's really important that um, maybe more outreach is even done too. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is also um, a good point all the way around. Um, and uh, some specificity and, I mean, the highlights about concerns about affordability, concerns about the climate. I mean, I think, I think I really appreciate clarity, how we might make it better, um, and thresholds. Those are, there's, I think there's been a lot of consistent points made here. And um, appreciate that. Would, does staff have any questions or clarification from the commission? I don't at this time. Does Anyone from the rest of the team? And John, you'll email your comments in and just so yeah. they have the text. Cool. Okay. Just so the communication's clear. Yeah, I had a really difficult time with the file because some of the tables were corrupted in the download that I got. I tried it a few oh. times and they were overlapping and when I tried to change them it just blew the file up. So um, I tried it on both platforms and it, I couldn't get it right. So. All, I've, I've done some hard copy work on the actual mm -hmm. measures and the point the point scores, but as far as the policy goes and the threshold, et cetera, that's in a text file or it's a, a word file. Okay, great. Thank you for, for sending that on. Um, one additional comment? This is great. Like, I love disagreeing up here with you all because that's what we're here for. Um, Tiffany, we had a brief conversation earlier about the coming energy code and what might be coming our way like in the next 18 months for yes. other reach code thoughts. You want to just give us a little prep on that so sure. people know what's at our way? So uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. As I mentioned, um, you know, we hit, there are a number of things that we need to bring forward to meet our targets and another that um, we have been uh, looking at is a low carbon concrete ordinance for new construction. Um, Yes, it is something that other jurisdictions obviously are doing as well. It represents a huge greenhouse gas emissions component in our built environment. Um, and um, the viability of doing so has come a long way uh, in the last decade. So um, that will, we're targeting the end of the first half of calendar year 2025. And of course, we will be bringing that to you all for a hopefully robust discussion like uh, you had today. Okay, great. Well, with that, I want to thank, definitely thank staff for all of your hard work and continued hard work and pushing us on getting to those goals. And thanks to all the commissioners as well for really thoughtful comments and also to the um, members of the public who came to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Well, and that will conclude that item. Um, and next we'll have um, Mr. Van Wa. Do we have any informational items? That's the next thing on the agenda. We, we added the ad well, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going across on here, so I think maybe that just didn't get moved. Okay, I was kind of wondering about that. Let's, no let's uh, put that where it usually is um, and um, go to item number four the Ad Hoc Subcommittee on Downtown Plan Expansion. Okay, great. Uh, so just to set the context there, next week planning is going to council on October 22nd uh, to report back to council, which they requested a few months ago, uh, outlining an approach to our downtown density bonus uh, as it relates to the, that downtown expansion plan that we're working on right now. We're also gonna be during that meeting, bringing forward uh, information on existing anti-displacement measures that are also going to be currently existing and will be part of the downtown plan as well. Uh, 
But the, the key thing here and, and most important to planning commission is that uh, this downtown density bonus, what we're really seeking to do here is an approach to get developers to go with the city downtown density bonus route versus the state density bonus. So we have to find incentives for people to go that route versus the city dens versus the state density bonus where we lose local control, for instance. So we need to provide additional incentives to still get that control back in some way. Um, and so that's that's the real goal there. Uh, we've changed, we've managed to, we over the last few months, we've done a lot of work on figuring out uh, different affordability percentages, figuring out how to both increase the total affordable percentage uh, while having a lower overall potential financial impact, for instance. Uh, it's kind of one key thing we're looking at doing. Um, but the big thing, too, in this is that as part of this city downtown density bonus approach, uh, we're putting forward uh, an idea to have a design review committee and uh, a discretionary process that a developer would enter into as part of receiving these uh, incentives through the downtown density bonus program. So they would be receiving incentives uh, for their projects in terms of the amount of development they can do on a site, but we would be also receiving incentives by way of having more control over design and <coughs> going through this discretionary process with them. So planning staff is seeking to have a, a subcommittee created with the planning commission over the next month to work with planning staff more uh, to further develop that program uh, around the, the design review committee and what that looks like and kind of setting the guidelines for that committee. Because um, ideally we would put these into the draft plan, which we're hoping to complete in the next month or so. The, finish our EIR process. So it's a lot of information. Wonderful uh, and very exciting. Is, and a lot of that is outlined in our report to council that was just posted today. Yep. So a lot more information that dives into more details there, but that's the highest level overview I could right. provide there. There's a lot of seeds there about some very exciting things um, coming down the road, and um, which is really great to hear. Like missing middle housing, maybe. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and and uh, a, a lot of really um, hard thinking about how to get there. It's um, really great to know that there's work on a process that can address design, which is. You know, even the a lot of people who are in really excited that we are both protecting our green space and finally meeting our housing needs, what I hear all the time is, oh, but design, and we have no tools. Um, so this is, this is really groundbreaking and really exciting. Um, does anybody have any comments? Um, or, I mean, I know it's, we're going to have so many questions that we can't really ask tonight, but you're free to ask questions, but um, we're going to see this item later so just to be clear um, that what we're being asked to do is to set up a very ad hoc very short term really just for the month of november um, uh, ad hoc committee to help craft um, this process and make sure we're hitting it all and the f the commission will see everything i'm not exactly sure what the timeline is of that but um, um, you all will be seeing all of that work um, at a later date. Um, so, that, questions, yeah, that, comments? That's correct. Yeah. The, the overall plan itself would likely be coming to Planning Commission uh, February, March of next year and City Council mm -hmm. in April. Mm -hmm. So that's the overall goal of the timeline. Um, next week's meeting is really just to get further direction mm -hmm. and, uh, and an okay from Council on this general approach. Um, mm -hmm and the details of it. Um, and certainly, any commissioner is welcome to reach out to myself or project manager, Sarah Noisy. They want any further details on the overall process or you know yeah. what we're thinking in terms of this uh, downtown density bonus approach. Yeah, great. I have That's a question. Yes, mm -hmm. please, I just ahead. So just so I'm clear on what's happening here. So our action item is to create an ad hoc committee for the month of November, and who's going to sit on that committee? Are we going to choose chair. right now? No, the chair will appoint. Chair creates the, the subcommittee. Yeah. 
Um, and how many members three. are going to be on this ad hoc? But all from the Planning Commission? Mm -hmm. Three Planning Commissioners. And I, I mean, I know it is, um, it's so a So are we going to discuss that now? Who's going to sit on that? Or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, that we'll, we'll be setting that up um, before the end of the meeting. And again, this is extremely targeted to sit down and work with staff on process um, around design and, and um, you know, some of, the, some of the things that they're working on, objective standards and that sort of thing. So I just want to say thank you so much to the planning department for doing whatever we can to take some agency in this process. And so I know it's, you know, we've tried to turn the stone over in a million different ways. And so we're, I, I know there's other discussions about other opportunities, and this is just one. And I just want to say thank you. I think that's so I was involved in the, the downtown expansion, the middle section that's being built out now. And mm -hmm. this is a whole different thing than that. Mm -hmm. But in that context, the subcommittees were super great. Because you get things done fast, you could sure. call, call in, like call other people, and I, I was really convinced through that process how effective they are. Mm -hmm. And we had lots of them, and I really felt like transparency coming back to the commission. Yeah, was, it did. There will be totally a full fine. report. So we had mm -hmm. this. This is one meeting, possibly two. That's yeah, that's yeah. what this is, and it may very well be that there will be an opportunity that there will be further times when um, some of the people on this commission could offer expertise. So, um, okay. Any other thoughts or questions? So are we going to discuss who's sitting on that now? No, I'm, I'm just going to announce it. <laughs> okay, oh, and what, are, what considerations are you going to take into account? Um, so the, the way that it works is, um, so the chair appoints subcommittees, and what I'm planning on doing is appointing Commissioner Thompson, Commissioner Kennedy, and myself. And there's a range of decisions of, of uh, conversations about why that happened. Um, and landed there, but that is going to be the um, this ad hoc commission okay. that we'll um, be reporting back. That's and, and that's fine. Um, I just I think in the future we should start to pay attention to the districts. I'm one of the. Um, I know some of us here are appointed by district. Some of us aren't. I think I'm, maybe I'm the first one appointed by district, and I'm appointed by the fourth district, which is downtown. Mm -hmm. um, so I. No, I think in the future, yeah. we probably should pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I also think it's comment. great to have expertise mm -hmm. on right. the commission as well, so I get it. Yeah. But, it but yeah, thanks for that comment. I mean, I wasn't in favor of creating districts, but we have districts, so. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So yeah. thank you for that. Did you want to state on the record what the length of the, the life of the subcommittee is? The life of the subcommittee is... Um, really determined by council, but as it was described to me, it will be one or two meetings that will conclude their work by the end of November. Correct. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a very brief ad hoc um, um, in this case. Okay. Um, and with that, uh, now we have information items. All right, thanks. Sorry, I didn't even see the order there, too. Yeah, I know. I that. was going down the list. Probably went... went goes better this way. All right, uh, information items. I'll start with community meetings. Uh, September 30th, uh, which was before the, our, our last meeting with the commission, uh, 1811 Mission, uh, which is on the corner of Dufour. That's a six-story, 68-unit project. Uh, there's a community meeting for that. Um, the typical concerns noted there were design, massing, and traffic. So we, we heard those and moved forward with the project uh, with those comments in mind. Matt, there was some, um, there was some pretty positive uh, press coverage about that meeting in terms of like communication between neighbors and the developer. Was that your sense? Oh, great. I, I was not at the meeting. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll talk to. Never mind. I, I just heard from Sam. So that, that's good that it, it went well from a communication standpoint. Oh, that's what I heard through the media. So I'll talk to Sam and see. But that's good to hear too, though. Yeah. Don't always get that press. Yeah, true. Can I ask uh, about the that I've been meaning to ask this about the the is there a system in which we decide what meetings are going to be Zoom and what meetings are public? What is 
what's the decision making process or is there is there a it's a good question we we have a outreach policy and it doesn't determine whether one has to be in person or one is on zoom i think it's typically just at the discretion of the the planner and what they may have heard from the community or what might be easiest for folks sometimes developers are from further away or something like that or you know consultants can't come in or maybe sometimes we found that online meetings just work better um, than in person for some folks and that was likely just at the discretion of the folks involved in the project but it's a good question and i, I will ask uh, our our project planners okay. uh, if there's any specific reason they did it one way versus another be a good follow-up item okay other updates uh, a few more community meetings so on uh, monday next week uh, 9 15 water the rasmussen property that's coming back for a, a resubmission it's changing the project a little bit uh, it was previously approved as 100 sros um, and because it, uh, it was a hundred percent affordable sro project um, it, that entitlement was subsequently taken on by another developer and They've been having trouble getting tax credits and all the various affordable housing financing lined up for that type of pro project. Um, so they've since, based on the tax credits and what they're getting in now, uh, had to increase the, the unit sizes uh, of, of those. And so it's coming back as an 83 unit project uh, and it's increasing from four to six stories in height. Okay, so, um, and so, let me so just it's considered that. a major change and needs to come back. And I don't know any more details beyond that. But you I meant think. 515 water. I heard 915. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. yes. Thank um, you. Yeah, wait, wait, I think wait. I wrote that down. Okay, so 515 water. And is it coming back to the commission or to council? Uh, this is just a community meeting to start. Really? Okay. Yeah, they haven't even formally submitted yet. Those are the only details I know at and this is that point. that meeting? On uh, Monday. Monday. Okay. Uh, yeah, Thank yeah. you. That's a really big one, right? Because all yep. the Yep. Okay. And then a uh, final community meeting uh, is uh, November 4th, uh, 831 Almar. That's a 120 unit project. Uh, council updates, uh, the ADU package uh, that planning commission saw in early September went to council uh, a couple weeks ago, or last week. Yeah, last week. Been some long weeks. Uh, uh, so council did not approve the ADU condo conversion uh, or the removal of owner occupancy for the pre-2020 ADUs uh, that staff and PC, our planning commission had recommended. Uh, council did uh, make a motion that ADUs uh, can now be included in the rental inspection program, um, but would, would instead of opting all of them in, and then having and then requiring them to exempt out if they're renting to family or they're not renting them at all, uh, that they would only be an opt-in situation. So they would now be part of the rental inspection program, but they would have to opt into it rather than having everyone opt in and then exempt out. So if you're currently an ADU owner and you're not renting it or you're renting it to family members, you wouldn't have to enter into the rental inspection service program I have one question on that one mm -hmm. at least I feel like those people who did the right thing and then like now are stuck with the owner occupancy thing got kind of like caught up in the politics with the whole condo thing would it be possible to send that back to council just that one piece to like let those people out off the hook I know those people like for me and up here and they really did like jump through the hoops again and again and did you listen to the discussion because they they specifically were clear that they didn't want the owner occupancy it wasn't just wrapped up in the condo thing. That. okay yeah it, it is going back to a second reading next week as well so i can't say if mm -hmm. things will change at all then uh, so now is the time for comments it will be heard again uh correct and we also have heard since that meeting, there's been a lot of correspondence on state law and there's definitely a lot of confusion around the state law as far as owner occupancy pre 2020 goes. And so uh, we've, we've received several letters from folks saying that state law says you just can't allow owner occupancy period. 
Um, but reading the state law itself, staff and the city attorney have so far interpreted differently. Um, and we're still awaiting formal official confirmation from the state on this uh, a year later. There's not a specific answer quite yet. So, uh, okay, when is that second reading? That's that's also going to be on the 22nd. 22nd of October. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the news there. So we don't have an answer yet from HCD on the owner occupancy piece, but staff and the and the city attorney still feel like council does have choice in that matter based on how the legislation was written but we shall see how that uh, how that goes um, one more thing to note for council uh, the Woodhouse brewing decision that was also made by Planning Commission uh, was appealed to council and that appeal uh, is tentatively set for uh, the November 19th meeting tentatively And then uh, a few more items coming Planning Commission's way. Uh, we're going to be coming back to you November 7th for more ADU items. Clara had mentioned that there was new state laws that we're, again, reacting to very quickly. There's certain ones that uh, require amendments that need to be in place before January 1st. So in addition to the big package that we had just done, there's a few more items that need to come to uh, Planning Commission and City Council. Um, so we'll be we'll be coming back to you on November 7th for that as well as if there's any potential significant changes based on you know HCD's consideration of our of our proposed amendments if there's changes needed those would come back then as well um, and then December 19th if which is the meeting right before uh, the holiday break if there is a quorum uh, that would be the meeting where uh, SB 35 policy and the 831 water project would be coming back to Planning Commission. Uh, if there isn't a quorum that date, uh, it would likely, we would likely need to do a special meeting a week earlier. I'm out of town November 7th, just so you know. Okay. 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 And that, that concludes the updates for now. Thank you. Okay. Chair. Um, did you say uh, December 19th? Correct. Oh, yeah. Sam wanted to get a little rally to see if okay. we were going to have quorum. So if you December could put that in there. Correct. Everybody uh, let yeah, us know if we're going to have a quorum. I, I'll be here. Yep. Yep. Anybody hey, know we'll, they're gone? I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, sounds like we'll all be here. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you very much. I don't think we have any items referred to future agendas. Um, so with that, I'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely.